Hi folks, today we are looking at lesson 9, multi-trait inheritance. I'm just going to go over the highlights as always. If you have questions, please don't forget to post them in that document that we've all created and uh, come to office hours to look for specific examples to be done or to answer the questions you might have about this lesson. Uh, you should be working on your lab on Friday, from Friday as well as working on it today if you haven't finished it already. Uh, and that's pretty much what the gist of what we'll be doing today. So, uh, when we look at multi-trait inheritance, we're going to talk about dihybrid crosses. And a dihybrid cross is just a cross that includes two genes or two different uh, traits that we're going to be looking at. And it each consists of heterozygous alleles. For example, seed shape and seed color. So we're going to let R represent wrinkled seeds, uh, lowercase r, and then capital R will represent round seeds. And then we're going to, because we're dealing with two genes, we have to look at that second grouping of alleles. We're going to let small g or lowercase g represent green seeds and uppercase g represent yellow seeds. So heterozygous individuals. So that means that they're going to have, be heterozygous for both genes or both traits. This heterozygous parent is going to be having the recessive allele present but not expressed. And it's going to have two sets of chromosomes. They're independent, right? So, note, I put a note here and it's very important and I'm highlighting it to draw that importance to it. The alleles for seed color and seed shape are located on different chromosomes. They are located on different chromosomes. The alleles do not separate with one particular pair. And this leads us into the discussion of Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment, which is probably one of the most important things you'll learn from this unit because it is a critical, critical component to genetics as a whole, but more importantly to your understanding of how genes are actually passed on. So Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment states that a heterozygous individual for two traits will produce four possible gamete combinations. The alleles for lowercase r and uppercase r, as well as lowercase g and uppercase g, separate independently during formation of the gametes. I cannot stress this enough. This happens during anaphase, that random assortment component, and it happens randomly. Therefore, the inheritance of seed shape has no influence over seed color. One trait does not impact the other. Each allele is independent of each other on different chromosomes. They separate with different probabilistic chances. So that means, in the example above, where the uh, individual is heterozygous, or the, the plant is heterozygous for both traits, that means that it's going to have four possible gamete outcomes, right? Capital G, lowercase r, lowercase g, capital R, capital G, capital R, lowercase g, lowercase r. Okay, in the, in the notes I go over how that's done. So please read through those notes and if you have questions about it, come see me in office hours. But again, I'm just going over the general idea of independent law, uh, law of independent assortment. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about in the same vein of that idea is the idea of discontinuous versus continuous variation. This is a bit of a longer one, but again, this is the key highlight from this lesson and it's a very important concept not only to our unit, but to genetics and biology as a whole. So recall from our lesson in all the way back, I want to say, oh God, lesson two or three back when we were in real school, in Mendel's pea plants, the genes that control two characteristics did not interact with each other, right? They were independent of each other. They didn't interact with each other. Pea plants were tall or short. Seeds were yellow or green. There was no in-between. Zero in-between. This is a result of what's called discontinuous variation. Discontinuous variation. In discontinuous variation, alleles are not dependent upon each other. They're two distinct chromosomes, two distinct outcomes. In continuous variation, it's, as you can imagine, the exact opposite. It's where that variation is not clear cut and the product of one gene is affected by the product of another gene. The gene product products may be additive or one product might negate another product. And then we talk about skin color as well as height. That's again, I used that example in some of the last lessons previously. It's why if you have a darker skin parent and a lighter skin parent, you'll be somewhere in the middle, but it won't be perfectly cut in half it will be some type of blend. One could be darker, one could be lighter. And if you have siblings, one of your siblings could be a little lighter, could be a little darker. It really is due to that continuous variation, those multiple genes having an additive effect. And that additive gene contributes to a set amount of phenotypes. So each allele makes it its own contribution. 
and exhibits incomplete dominance. I know it's a bit of a tricky concept to understand. Again, this is not for me to explain it in more detail. It's just to go over the main ideas that are important. So that idea that there's that mixing, but it's not necessarily going to be 50-50, right? If you have four siblings, one dark parent, one light-skinned parent, you're not going to all be right cut down in half the exact mix of both of those parent shades. It's going to be an additive effect based on which genes and which alleles contribute to that overall skin color and how many you get from one versus the other. And if there's like 11 genes that contribute to skin color, it can be anywhere from, you know, you getting one from your dad and being not that dark and then getting eight from your dad and being a bit more darker, right? So we talk about the alleles for red hair as well as freckles and they play a role in skin color and they cannot use uh, Punnett squares to predict this. So this is like another, that last key important thing. You can't really use Punnett squares to predict this because there's no probabilistic pr prediction for multivariant traits. And I don't wanna get into too much detail. If we were in day school, I would show you the statistics of it. It's just two bananas right now. Uh, even when you're in, in undergraduate, when you, if you study this uh, in university, they use computer simulations and programs to run those, right? Because it, the, the calculations and the possible outcomes are just ridiculously too high. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I just wanted to kind of go over the base understanding of this concept from this lesson. Uh, so Keanu says, I'll see you in office hours and I'll say the same to you. Again, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email or post it in that document. Ms. Pullman and I frequent it often uh, and I'll see you in office hours.